Hey everyone, I'm Julian. And I'm Melissa. And this is Equal Illawarra, the show that's keeping you up to date with stories from around the Illawarra community. Today, we'll look at a decision that affects many women when getting married, and new technologies that are helping rid negative stereotypes surrounding people with disabilities. We'll also find out why unisex toilets are creating a bit of a stir at the University of Wollongong. To kick off today's show, I looked into how the University of Wollongong is helping to improve the aspirations of underrepresented primary and secondary school students. Let's take a look. Although studying at university has become a popular option for high school leavers, for some students, making the choice to attend university can be a difficult decision. The Inter-Uni program has been supporting underrepresented primary and secondary school students since 2011, helping them understand what university life is really like. The big message that we try and tell kids out in schools is that they've got options after they finish high school and that even though they think there might be barriers to coming to university, that will help them to overcome those barriers and to get there. Yeah, I thought about it a bit, but this day was pretty like inspiring and stuff, so it's good to like come. No, never thought about uni before and yeah, I found it pretty good and I actually think I might go to uni. <laughs> I decided that I do want to go to uni and I want to succeed in doing other things. Cannahooker High School has been involved with InterUni since 2011 and teacher Tony Panacasio believes the program has made a considerable impact on his students. The big benefits for our kids are that they actually consider it as a possibility now. If you'd asked our kids five years ago what they wanted to do, out of the graded class that was our top koala class, probably out of the 30 kids, you'd be lucky if five thought university was an option. That class that was the original class is now in year 11, and out of that year 11 class, 26 out of the 30 are considering university as a potential career path. I thought about going to uni because I want to be a teacher when I grow up, so I'm going to have to study at uni really hard. If you know what you want to do and you want to make it here, you just got to try as hard as you can. Even if you don't really know what you want to aim for, if you just go through high school, you can find something that you want to do, yeah. Making the transition from high school to university can be daunting, so the program offers several initiatives to help with the lifestyle change. Some of the incentives that we offer our Year 12 students to make that transition to university and to make that transition to university a lot smoother is um, financial scholarships to overcome any financial burdens of transitioning to higher education, but also getting them to start studying their university subjects before they actually finish the HSC so they can have a taste and start to feel comfortable about uh, what a university environment is like. The big thing that uh, we find is because they've had the staging points throughout from year seven on and we've had the mentors come out to our school regularly each year and run programs, it demystifies the whole process. University isn't that building that they drive past and never consider as something that they could do. They're very comfortable coming here and it's got to the point now where it's normal. It's really good, like the mentors are great, like they're nice and they know what you want and they help you with any questions you've got. Yeah, it kind of helped it out a little bit, made me feel a little bit more relaxed about it. It seems like a good place to come for like, you know, the courses and stuff. Not only are we supporting students to get into university, uh, but we're also supporting our local community as well and I think that that's a really important aspect of us um, as who we are as a university. From as far and as wide as Burma, Ethiopia and Somalia, hundreds of refugees have resettled in our beautiful region. But what experiences do they have when they get here? One local organisation, the Strategic Community Assistance to Refugee Families, or SCARF, is looking to make that resettlement process easier, as Samara Gardner finds out. In 2005, SCARF was founded with the aim of helping refugee students with their homework. Eight years later, it is now a multi-program organisation, providing assistance to a community of over 500 refugees in the Illawarra. For youth program facilitator Monique Bolas, SCARF offers the opportunity for Wollongong to prove itself as a welcoming place. We've just got so many amazing communities and individuals in Wollongong and it would just be such a shame not to give them a chance to show everyone what they've got. It's Monique's role to look after the very popular Music, Art, Dance and Drama or MAD program. MAD is run weekly through SCARF and allows refugee children to express themselves creatively. It can be very socially isolating, especially if you have that language barrier. But things like dance, you don't need great English skills to express yourself in that. It's just amazing. You get to do what you like doing and having fun and yeah, just like expressing yourself. Another initiative run by the group is SCARF Catering. 
which aims at improving a local sense of multiculturalism by introducing to the local community a broad range of cultures and cuisines, including Ethiopian, Togolese, Iraqi and Burmese. It's catering with a twist. Have you tried any restaurant in town? Are you sick of cooking for your friends? Then have us over, we'll come to your house and we'll also teach you a little bit about their culture. For Tang Hatzo, scarf catering allows him to share his eclectic style of cuisine and his Burmese culture with members of the local community. I come from Burma. I was living in Malaysia with my family and then I was coming in Australia. Catering is a family affair for Tang, whose extended family is involved in the preparation of the food. We are family and my culture of food we cook and um, I love it. Scarf Catering offers courses and training to the refugee chefs so that they may one day be able to run their own businesses. But a lack of government funding means that operating these scarf programs is often a struggle. We haven't had any government funding this year which makes it extremely difficult to offer what we'd like to what we need to to the communities. This lack of government funding means that volunteers are an integral part of SCARF. Amnesty Wollongong co-convener Virginia Smelchek said that volunteering was beneficial for both the individual and the community. We need to do things for other people and, that, and basically it makes you feel good. When you meet someone who's come this way and who feels accepted, it makes you feel good. Currently, SCARF has a volunteer pool of 130 community members. With interest in SCARF projects now being generated outside of the Illawarra, Caitlin said Wollongong should be proud of its support of the refugee community. I think Wollongong can really stand up and be proud and be like, well, hello Sydney, what have you done? Our reporter Courtney Howe caught up with Wollongong's Lord Mayor Gordon Bradbury to discuss multiculturalism and youth unemployment. Look, uh, Wollongong has established on multiculturalism, multiculturalism in as much that uh, after the Second World War we had a great influx of people who came from Europe and more specifically Southern Europe and uh, so all those who were dislocated because of the Second World War, we had large numbers of people established themselves here as well as people from Britain. So there's a real multicultural flavour that's been just part of the ethos of Wollongong for such a long time. The Strategic Community Assistance Refugees Families, or SCARF, um, in Wollongong has really developed a large community within the Illawarra. Why do you think it's so important to have organisations and groups such as this in the city? Well, people who are newcomers need support in as much that many of them just go straight on to uh, Centrelink benefits. So many don't know, are not familiar with Australian ways and culture. I mean, it's a, I, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of the confrontation that must occur when you've got people on the beach, and we've got 17 patrol beaches and so on, in cases, pr pretty uh, limited attire, if I can put it like that. And then you've got Islamic, uh, the Islamic culture uh, confronting that sort of thing. You know, I was down at one of our Berkeley pools not so long ago, and there were people from Afghanistan, refugees from Afghanistan in the full uh, gear, you know, women, going into the pool, you know, whereas Aussies are used to wearing next to nothing and going straight into the water, you know, sort of. Uh, so that was a fine example of how I think people need to be aware that there's got to be a lot of adjustment. Jumping to uh, employment in the Illawarra and particularly youth unemployment, which is always an issue that is brought up, um, why do you believe that the youth unemployment rate in Wollongong is so high? Well, for a start, uh, we've lost a lot of jobs in the unskilled and semi-skilled areas. Okay, so what it, what would happen is if you didn't you didn't do too well at school, you could move into those areas, get an apprenticeship, and and the opportunity to uh, enter into the workforce. At the present time, the workforce uh, and the expectations of the of the uh, st of um, those wanting to find employment here are high in terms of their technical and professional abilities and there's a large gap between those abilities and the next group. Finding a job can be difficult but what if your chances of gaining employment depended on your age? The Illawarra has one of the highest rates of youth unemployment in the country. Likewise, the participation rate of older workers in the Illawarra is below the national average. Courtney Howe finds out whether age is just a number. Youth unemployment currently stands at 13.4%, a reality Elena Phillips soon learned after moving to Wollongong last year. Elena was surprised to discover how difficult it was to find a job despite using a number of services. I pretty much did everything under the sun. I, yeah, I used Seek and Indeed, they were really helpful and I just went resume dropping around a lot of the malls and I looked in the Mercury and their job classifieds thing as well 
Um, and then just word of mouth too, if I had friends who um, knew of a job going, I'd apply there as well. Melissa De Bennett, a research analyst at Iris Research, says there are a number of factors that lead to youth being unemployed in the Illawarra. Lack of imp- education, lack of experience in the workforce, um, other facts can come into it, uh, especially in pockets around the Illawarra that have uh, high unemployment, generational unemployment. Um, lots of factors go into uh, what makes people unemployed. Elena believes her age and previous experience factored into the probability in getting the job she applied for. So I didn't have any retail experience, which I think was a big issue. And also, I think it's because I'm 21, I'm kind of like in an in-between age where a lot of retail stores want to hire people who are really young, whereas the kind of more admin businessy positions want to hire more mature people. However, it's not just the younger workers who have difficulty in obtaining jobs. Older workers face similar barriers. Dr Martin O'Brien, head of School of Economics at the University of Wollongong, has conducted research in employment in older workers and says while statistics show low unemployment, Typically, once an older worker loses their job, they are unlikely to gain another. I'm looking at a study right now on Bluescape Steel in Port Kembla. So those workers that were made redundant just over the last year or two when Bluescape downsized, the type of skills that a steel worker have are not really the appropriate skills for the type of new jobs that are generally available. While age might just be a number, to Dr O'Brien it comes with certain stigmas when applying for jobs. Age is just used as a, a general indicator and it's typically that the, the younger people are seen as more trainable, um, less set in their ways and more likely to be getting shortlisted and, and getting a job rather Marriage than is meant to be a happy and exciting time for couples, but with marriage comes a tradition many women are starting to question. Should they keep their names or take their husbands? Lizzie Hunter has the story. I never really thought any different really. I just kind of thought that was what happened when I got married. I just changed my last name. Though many women are keeping to tradition by taking their husband's names, there has been an increase in the number of women who are choosing to keep their maiden names when getting married. Recently engaged student Andy Gale is choosing to keep her maiden name for working purposes, but would like to take her fiancé's name when married. I think a marriage is all about teamwork and partnership and about seeing yourselves as equals. And so by taking your last name, you're kind of reinforcing the fact that you see each other as equals. Fewer women are changing their name because it makes sense that people have got a career. If they've been in a career for a long time, to suddenly change their name, whereas girls are getting married at, say, 20, 21, 23, they haven't been in the workforce for as long. So it's not a big change then as a teacher to change their name from maiden name to a new married name. Myself, I got married again six years ago. So I've kept my first married name because anybody, everybody knows me just as Deborah Jenkins. So you can do the split as well. A lot of people tend to do that nowadays. UOW FEMSOC member Jesse Hunto Mendax believes men and women should do what feels right for them at the time. It's definitely symptomatic of the fact that the way we understand marriage is changing kind of ever so slightly as, as time goes on. But it's also, I suppose, symptomatic of the fact that we're, we're thinking more of ourselves as kind of individuals and, and marriage is less about uh, tradition and less about religion and more about kind of individuals and identity and relationships. The idea of everybody having the same last name, it kind of gives you, I guess, a sense of belonging and kind of forms a family unit. I think the the trend towards keeping your own name probably is inspired by the women's movement or by feminist sort of principles. There's, you know, a really well-established feminist critique of why um, we might like to sort of change that tradition, change that social norm of women taking their husband's surname. So, you know, that's a tradition that's really based in a sort of property arrangement which positions women in marriage as... Basically, the possessions are under the control of their husbands. And, you know, we know why feminists would want to critique that idea. <laughs> We'd want to say that we should have more equal sorts of um, relationships. Do you see more women actively saying, hey, um, I'm going to keep my own name? Uh, personally, for my particular relationship with feminisms, uh, yes. Uh, it's definitely an argument that I'm fully convinced by, the argument that um, you know, there's no need for women to take their uh, husband's names if they are getting married in a you know, heterosexual marriage situation or whatever. 
But do I think it's going to keep increasing? I think we shouldn't underestimate the forces of sort of backlash and conservatism. Speaking of marriage, um, the ACT um, within the past few weeks has passed um, same-sex um, marriage laws. Uh, what's your thought on that one? So the latest commentary that, or the latest opinion that I've read is that it, um, the ACT legislation is actually unlikely to survive a High Court challenge. Um, and I think that sort of that particular political moment that we find ourselves in, where the federal government wants to challenge the ACT government in the High Court around the issue of same-sex marriage, I think that's a disappointingly conservative political moment. Uh, but I do also have a concern in a slightly different way, which is not so much. Um, you know, will same-sex marriage legislation be challenged or be knocked down? Um, but also in terms of what might be happening to a sort of broader queer political agenda um, if all of our energies are channeled into the issue of same-sex marriage. People whose gender identity is different from their assigned sex at birth often face many problems, discrimination and a lack of understanding from the general public. Andrea Hogan has a story on how a group of students are fighting back. Popping off to the loo when at uni or just out and about is something most of us don't think twice about. For UOW student Bugs Nash, however, it can be one of the hardest times of the day. As transgendered, Bugs is constantly faced with the question of where exactly is safe to go. I've been yelled at for going into women's bathrooms, for going to men's bathrooms, for going to accessible bathrooms. Like There's just nowhere that's safe for me that I know I can go to without harassment. With unisex toilets often the facility of choice for transgendered people, Bug says they are a rare find, causing inconvenience a lot of people would not even be aware of. Being out in public and needing to pee becomes a really sort of stressful experience and, you know, people have enough stress in their lives, they don't need to deal with that on top of everything else. Like, I just need to pee, you know. Trying to help bring about some awareness is the National Union of Students, who have launched the campaign We All Need to Pee. Thousands of stickers are being put up in campus bathrooms nationwide with the aim of flushing away the problem with a bit of toilet humour. These stickers, they say things like, we all need to pee, um, I'm here to pee, not to be gender stereotyped. It's just sort of taking a um, bit of a jab at the way that people think. Telling students it is not okay to decide whether someone belongs in a particular bathroom or not, the campaign has already seen some early success. One person just posted a blog post on Tumblr, um, having seen the stickers at their university campus, um, saying how much they liked it. And the post got like 40,000 likes and shares. It was just huge. Supported by transgendered students like Bugs, they say it's a good start to fixing the problem. Although more unisex bathrooms are really what is needed to help transgendered students feel comfortable. I find people are generally getting more accepting of other demographics that they before now have mostly been closeted, I suppose. Um, so I hope that we would be moving into a space where we can work those plans into new buildings and stuff like that, yeah. According to UOW's Director of Facilities Management, Bruce Flint, he says the university currently provides a number of unisex bathrooms through accessible facilities. I can't give you the actual number, but I, I know in each building we have a um, unisex accessible um, toilet. And the current building code of Australia requires that basically you have a, a unisex accessible toilet on each floor of the building. For people like Bugs, however, they say that they are at risk of being harassed for using accessible toilets when they are not disabled. They say the small number of just unisex toilets on campus should be increased. Wherever it's appropriate, we, we look at that. But I think too what we're about is sort of, I suppose, breaking down all sorts of barriers, whether you're transgender or, or whatever. And for those out there yet to see the stickers, Bug says it is quite simple what you need to do if you come across someone and begin to wonder why they are in a particular bathroom. If you're in a bathroom and you see somebody there that you don't think belongs there or who doesn't look to you like they should be there, shut your mouth. Um, if they're not hurting anybody or doing anything inappropriate and they're just going about their business, you should do the same thing. We hope you're enjoying the show so far. Sadly, we're nearing the end, but don't go away just yet because we've got two more videos to watch. The first deals with equality for people who have a vision impairment and the second is about equality in Indigenous women's health. In between, we've got comments from Kath Tanner, a lecturer of special education at the University of Wollongong. Helpless and unemployable are two common stereotypes used to describe people with a disability. This doesn't surprise 70-year-old Jeff Stratton. 
Working as a physiotherapist for 30 years, people have always questioned his abilities. With the help of adaptive technologies, Jeff works easily with computers. He uses a program that converts text to voice. You can put it in. But Jeff doesn't think adaptive technology on its own will be enough to banish stereotypes. Organisations in the Illawarra, such as Vision Australia, have installed these new technologies to provide opportunities for employment and communication to people with a vision impairment. This is a standard size form, so then you know I can fill it in, so I can write like this. Cassie Hassel received government funding to install adaptive technology on her computer at work. I think the, the responsibility is on us a bit to let people see how things can work and how easy it is once you learn your program. Through the use of magnifying tools such as closed circuit television, Cassie can complete everyday tasks. You can actually just look at it like an ordinary magazine. I use a magnifier close to my face. I've had people come up to me and say, are you smelling that newspaper? And you know, so sometimes I just laugh off and say, yes I am, and other times I'm actually using a magnifier. Russell Dine spends his time demonstrating and explaining adaptive technologies to prospective employers. I think employers are understandably concerned when something is suggested to be put onto their system. These days, however, they're a little less apprehensive because these softwares have been around for quite a few years. However, Russell believes the number of people with a vision impairment in the workforce is still very low. The perception of employers is that it's going to be difficult to work with uh, vision impaired people simply because it's something new and they think there's going to be many hindrances. Although there may be barriers, adaptive technologies are a step towards equality. Once upon a time an audio book was just something I did. Now my friends fight me for my books. If we talk about media representation of course, who do we tend to, who, who is represented um, more frequently? Um, so I, I suppose we take, for example, something like the Paralympics that's just been held in London. Um, and that came to the fore. We saw a lot more people who had quite visible disabilities. Um, but the thing that I found uh, quite interesting when I was watching that was who was actually filmed and what were the photographs of and how were they photographed. So quite often um, you always saw that the, the, the body image, the beauty myth image coming through. Um, so the very strong, athletic, almost super crip um, image that we saw. Um, we didn't see those people who might have had quite complex um, disabilities so visually uh, they their appearances weren't um, the norm so th that seems to be the underrepresented group. I think in the past that has been um, one of the things that uh, research has shown to looking at images particularly um, movies and look at the stereotypes in movies and I think of something like kids movies um, and for example oh, a good movie might be something like Peter Pan. Who is it in Peter Pan that has the disability? It's the evil character of Captain Hook. I don't think it's a matter of, uh, of improving, I just think it's a, a matter of awareness. In the Illawarra, communities of Indigenous women often face a high rate of ill health. Waminda is a Shohaven based organisation that aims to not only promote Indigenous women's equality, but also empower Aboriginal women to make informed decisions about their physical and emotional well-being. Glenda Dixon and Marissa Dick are two Indigenous women who are empowering themselves by taking control of their own health and well-being with the help of Waminda. When I first met Waminda four years ago, 
because I come from out inland, came up and they pretty much helped me. Mm. Only for them, I'm still alive today. Waminda provides a range of services for Indigenous women and their families, from sexual assault and domestic violence support, drug and alcohol support, and health clinics. I think Waminda is quite unique in that it's very, um, it's it's like it's made for Aboriginal women. So you know, um, culturally, it's uh, it's very appropriate, and I think um, they feel safe here. Like it's it's almost like a, a safe place that they can come and know that they'll be treated with respect and without judgment. Um, because I think that happens a lot in mainstream. The core of Waminda is Indigenous women helping Indigenous women. Here at the Respite House, Aboriginal women come together to talk to each other, obtain emotional support and help with personal issues. Well, we all get together, the women, and we just um, discuss any problems we have. We can talk together and just pour out our feelings and what's worrying us. It's like being family. Um, women has helped me so much. We come together as a group, us women, and we work on um, different projects. Helen and the other women at the Respite House create artworks and murals to develop social and emotional well-being. When I paint, I always start, I like to do a circle, a circle of life. And in this circle, um, we, this here is us, the women. We're all on a journey together. And um, these little round circles here can be uh, life's pathways that can lead us to lose our ways and then you know we can get back on track again with help of people and that and one of that one another. Waminda also focuses on physical health providing training sessions, boxing and fitness as well as educating women on health risks such as smoking. Our community women need a place where they can go where it's culturally appropriate but also that has all the services that they need and they're not actually going to and fro from different places, obviously they get that one-on-one -on -one support, which you necessarily don't get from other services. It would be good for other communities to do the same, you know, for, for the women. That was our reporter Shannon, ending the show for today. We'll see you next time with another episode of Equal Illawarra. I'm Alyssa. And I'm Julian. Thanks for watching.